Hello and welcome to Ithaca DSA Presents. I'm Teresa Alt. I'm here with co-host David Foote. David, explain why we're here. Well, we are here to let you know that Starbucks in Ithaca has been mistreating, firing, and driving out its employees. Now, these workers need help, like the rest of us. They have bills, rent, and need to get around every day, other expenses of their daily lives. And unfortunately, their ability to provide for themselves and for their families is being intentionally limited by the Starbucks Corporation. But they'll say more about that in the interview we're about to listen to. If you can help fund these workers as they fight for justice in their workplace, you'll find a link to donate to their strike fund in the description of this video. Jane Glaubman interviewed two Starbucks workers about life at work. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jane Glaubman. I'm an organizer with the Ithaca branch of the Democratic Socialists of America. And I'm here today with two of the workers from our local branches of Starbucks, which have been unionizing over the past several months. And I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves now. First, Nadia, tell us about yourself, okay. please. Hi, I'm Nadia Vitek. I use they, them pronouns. And I was a barista at the College Ave location. I worked there for about 10 months. Hi, I'm Steph Hawkins. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a somewhat former Starbucks worker of the Commons location, and I've been working there for about seven months. Could I ask what you mean by somewhat former? Uh, constructively discharged, uh, forced to quit because it was too much of a hostile work environment. <laughs> wow. Yes. Not Thank by you. choice. Were both of you involved when the, uh, when the initial effort to organize the union started at Starbucks? Yeah, I've been, like, kind of around, like, since the beginning of it and, like, the early conversations when it was just, like, a few of us who were interested and we didn't really know, like, what we could make of it. But, you know, like, a few conversations slowly turned into a lot of conversations and, like, we are where we are now. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What about you, Steph? I applied to Starbucks in January, so that was after the initial letter already came out. And I'm not going to well, lie. I'm sorry. Could you tell the listeners about the letter? Oh, yeah. So the letter, um, on I saw it on Twitter at first. And it was basically just like a letter of intention stating that the Ithaca, the three Ithaca Starbucks branches, Commons, College Ave, and Meadows, were intending on unionizing. Mm -hmm. And then they had a bunch of people sign the letter. And I read it. I thought it was cool. But at the time, I didn't really understand the complete weight of a union. I now understand how cool it is. But at the time, I was like, oh, cool. Unions are good. And I applied because <laughs> so I just needed a job. But I figured right. it would be a good place to be. But right. over those months, I've learned lots of things. <laughs> <laughs> right. And experienced a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> Nadia, did you say that you worked at the College Ave branch? I did. Can yeah. you tell us a little bit about what it was like to work at that branch? Oh, my gosh. It was a lot. Um store is like very intense so it's like right off of Cornell campus and we get so many students like we get like I don't know students like kind of expect that they'll have to wait like up to 20 minutes sometimes to get wow. their drinks and it's just like very overwhelming there's always like a large crowd of like annoyed students um it's always busy it's always busy like this during the school year. Right. During the school year. And it, like, right. comes in waves with classes and stuff. But, like, it's a pretty intense, high-volume store. I see. Yeah. And, Steph, can you tell us about the commons? Is we, the commons as busy as? It's not as busy, but it's also, like, in downtown. So instead of, well, we do get, like, students, but we get more of, like, the tourists. Mm, and, and the just, buses. And the buses. We have a bus stop right in front of our store. So that's one of our biggest... Um, that's when our store has the most volume is when the bus stops and everyone goes and gets like their pit stop drink or pit stop snack. Uh, but our store, I don't think, has as much volume as your guys' would. We just get like the um, 
townsfolk of Ithaca, the buses, and then some students. And a bunch of people who are like, I am going to leave. This bus is leaving in five minutes. Get me my drink right now. Oh, my <laughs> God. I remember there was this one customer. And, like, I, it was 7 in the morning. I was still waking up. And, like, I was, you know, we're, we were going at a fine pace. And this person goes, no, I can't do this. I need my food now. And I was like, excuse me. Like, in my head, I just thought, wanted to say, why don't you get behind the bar and try and do it? Yeah. It's like the complete and utter disrespect to people sometimes. Mm-hmm. And I understand that comes with the territory because you can't always control other people. You don't know what they're going through. But when you have a corporation that you're working with, that does not make it any easier. It's like, all right, now I'm just mad. <laughs> yeah. And they make it difficult for customers to get their, like, orders on time, too. Yes. Oh, how, do, how does that happen? I mean, like, I can speak for College Ave specifically. Um, like... The main, like, source, uh, like, most people order on their phones, basically, and they come pick it up. And sometimes we'll have, like, 50 orders, and it's, like, all people who are, like, trying to get to class, like, time-sensitive orders. And then we'll have, like, sometimes, like, 30 drinks right. that just were not picked up because right. people yep. could not do it. But the thing is, like, when they order on the app, it still tells them that they'll get their drink on time or that's, like, expected to be on time, but it's, like not and instead of like turn like because the managers are able to turn off mobile orders when it gets really busy but they don't and Mm -hmm. so it's like really misleading to customers because they don't know how many orders are already in i see and they just can't get their drink on time i hope that made sense yeah like the starbucks algorithm is kind of like it does not incentivize like the workers efforts at all or like it doesn't try and understand the nuances of, like, because the store is very much, like, operated on a technological kind of robotic level where it's, like, because there's so many branches across the nation, across the world, really. So they do a lot of things by numbers. So mm. They don't really have the time to understand, like, the nuances within each store. How it works is in order to get a certain amount of labor hours in your store, you have to sell a certain amount of products. So it's based, I'm pretty sure it's based on profitability. Um, and the amount of customers you have. I mean, if they were to turn off mobile orders, it would indicate that the stores weren't really um, raking in the amount of mm. profits mm. and the amount of customers that they would need. It would affect their labor hours and in turn would affect how the labor hours would be distributed to the workers. Right. So in a sense, Starbucks is like, yeah, I don't care what the conditions are. If you want to work and if you want to properly schedule your workers, sorry, you got to work in these bad conditions that we're not really going to give yeah. a rat's back. Trying exactly. to understand. And then they use labor hours to justify, like, understaffing and underscheduling us. It's yeah. all made up. It's math. an inherently, like, anti-union principle, which mm-hmm. we've been trying to say over and over. Like, the corporation is literally set up. And a lot of corporations are, in a sense, too, are set up to go against the workers. Right. Right now we're proving, hey, the system that you have isn't working and your so-called partner-first mentality is not justified by the algorithm you have set up. Yet, exactly. they're not really bothering to change what goes to show. So that. people might not know about this. Is Starbucks' <laughs> official policy is that partners come first, and by partners, they mean people who work at the stores? Like, yeah, like so-called you. partners. Yeah. So-called partners. Mm-hmm. I don't feel like one. Yeah. And they have an algorithm. You've mentioned the algorithm. I'd never heard of the uh. Starbucks algorithm. So it's something that we figured out because, as we said, Starbucks likes to just make things up. And we've been trying mm-hmm. to figure out why our stores can't get labor hours. And I kind of got into why your stores can't get labor hours. The labor hours are the number of hours that the store is allowed to employ people to work. Yes. So if you've noticed that there's been a lot of boycotts going on in Ithaca, which the union has a right to exercise as a formed union. But because of the boycotts, um, some people in Ithaca are like, all right, I don't want to support Starbucks, which good for them. But it kind of backfired. So now the Mm -hmm. reason why people are like, why is Commons closing so early? It's because we don't have the labor hours. I see. And we can't go over the labor hours or else Starbucks will get mad. And then the following week, we'll have to deduct even more labor hours. So it's like Starbucks is punishing us for exercising our rights where it's like, hey, like that's within the right of this union. You're just going to show that you don't recognize this in the first place. Right. Or there were three branches, College Town, the Commons, which is on Seneca Ave, and then the third branch is on Meadows Street. Yes. Um, so Street. tell us about that branch. Yeah. So Meadow Street is a brand new store. And when we went live and we filed for a union election, they were actually one week old. So they're brand new. Um, can't speak to like what happens there. I haven't worked drive through for Starbucks, but I did work like a, another fast food job before Starbucks. 
drive throughs are no joke. Like, it's a whole other beast. Because not only are you getting customers coming in, you're getting cars. Mm. And, you know. So I think listeners might not understand, like, sort of what I was setting you up for is, like, that store is a drive through and the other two are not. So right. can you just explain that for a second? Yeah. So for that store, well, if it's anything like the place that I used to work at, you would get customers that can come in and order at the cafe, or you can people that are going through the drive through um, depending on how busy the day is. Like, I remember the store would be, like, double wrapped with cars on top of people ordering stuff in the cafe. So it's a, like, I mean, I haven't worked there either. I'm just saying from when I worked right. a fast food job, it can be pretty overwhelming because you're having two types of customers to accommodate at once. Mm-hmm. And if Starbucks is giving the same issues that I feel at my store or Nadia feels at their store, mm-hmm. I can only imagine how hard it is to tackle, you know, yeah. two types of... Like, That's they're doing so two types true. of beasts right there, a cafe and a drive through Talk to me about the evolution of your working conditions as the union campaign oh, went <laughs> on. Like, in the period between the time that the campaign went public and the time that you voted, um, can you talk a little bit about what things were like then? We went public, um, like, January 25th. Before we went public, our manager was in one time a week, and a few days after we went public, we had three managers in our store every day. So that was, like, the first really obvious um, difference. And, you know, they started off, like, kind of playing really nice um, to try to get it. I don't know, like, doing the nice guy tactic to try to be like, oh, you don't need a union. We're going to do everything you want right now, basically. Um, They tried to fix our grease trap, a bunch of other stuff. They were just, like, honestly being, like, creepily nice. Like, no one really, like, like, everyone just saw through that, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, oh my god, they tried to fix our grease trap, but then they ended up, like, having our water shut off the whole day, and then they didn't, like, accommodate us for that. Can you explain about the grease trap? Because I know that was the thing for the walkout strike. I mean, I'll get to that, Okay. But I can start by saying that the grease trap has been a problem for years. Um, Most Starbucks stores don't have a grease trap. I think it has to do with, like, the fast food stores around us. And there's just been grease there sitting there that's been collected for a very long time. What is a grease trap? Um, It's just, like... A vessel for old grease, I guess, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. And when it sits there, it gets really gross. There were like a bunch of maggots. Yeah. I didn't ask you about the walkout strike, mm. uh, although I was there. So some people may remember this. This was over the. I, I asked in detail about the grease trap before because that was the, the motivating factor. But can you can you describe what happened at that walkout yeah. strike? Was that was it, my day off. It was your day off. Yeah, but I was did it come. in May? Was it in May? Am I right? I think that? it was in May. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. So So what happened? Basically, what happened is that grease trap that I was talking about finally had enough and it overflowed into the back of house. So there's grease everywhere, all those maggots spilling also. Um, It smells like poop everywhere. Even the customers can smell it now. And also releasing some sort of unhealthy toxin probably i don't know what it's called but someone was like yeah there's like something that's not good and like it'll it's just not food safe like to be making people beverages and food with that in the air um and also grease all over the floor that's a slipping dangerous (laughs) slipping hazard the manager at the time was forcing everybody to work through that everyone was like no we're not doing that. That's just very, very unsafe. Everyone on the floor agreed to walk out. The store was shut down like 8 or 9 a.m. And yeah, we shut the store down for the whole day. Um, a bunch of people came out like just like super spontaneously and we had a megaphone and food and um, even like this restaurant across the street like brought us like a bunch of food for free just to support us, which was Wonderful. really sweet. That was a good day. And you had the right to do that because you had already won your union election, right? Yeah. And how long after that, um, that, first of all, what happened? How was it resolved? Why did you go back to work? Oh, right. Well, they fixed it. <laughs> so <laughs> we went back to work after that. I have to admit, I was, I was one of the people who was there that day uh, protesting outside mm-hmm. the store. And I remember when the, the person arrived with the uh, shop vac to clean out the grease trap. And from what I understood, you had been told that no one could be, it was a weekend and you were told that no one could be reached to fix it. And then somebody Mm. was there fixing it. Yeah, I don't remember the details, but that sounds right. And I remember it being like, oh, it might be a few days. And then it just like, it just happened. Yeah. 
reminds me of the chant, union busting. It's disgusting, literally. Support the workers when they are not getting paid. You can contribute at https colon slash slash www.gofundme.com slash f. That's f as in fiscal slash Ithaca hyphen SB hyphen workers hyphen United hyphen strike hyphen fund. So things took a turn when we got a new union buster and like we had a few like support managers is what they call them. The first day that she came in, she was in our store in our back of house for like hours and she didn't say hi to any of us or introduce herself. And we were like, who is this? And then later she introduces herself as like our new support manager, filling in for previous manager who is like not super available. So she's like, hi, I'm your acting manager now. <laughs> were there were there still three managers in the store or were uh, at the same time? I mean, like, they were honestly, like, traveling around. Ithaca. I see. They wouldn't always be there, like, 24-7, but they would just, like, pop in for a while. And they always were, like, all black. They felt like, like, crows. I was like, oh, my God, never more, never more. Oh ravens, ravens. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and they always were, like, really scarily positive. Mm-hmm. They were, like, yeah, the first thing that she told me was, like, your store looks like it needs some love. And for a second, I was like, yeah, we really do. But, like, I've been waiting for that love ever since. I've not felt that. Yeah. Um, she is, like, one. I've just seen too many people leave conversations with her in tears. Like, that, I feel like that says enough. How, how does she bring people to tears? Do you, can you give us that? Yeah, one example, which was, like, a part of, like, a union-busting tactic was, during spring break, our store has a lot of students in it since it's right off campus. During spring break, students want to go home and see their family or like hang out with their friends. Not crazy. Um, a bunch of people requested their time off well in advance for that. And out of the requests that this manager handled, she rejected all of them except for one. So one person, the first person to talk to her whose time off was rejected was like, I already booked a ticket. I want to see my family. I don't want to have to stay in Ithaca. And this manager basically told her that if she doesn't show up to those shifts, she'll be fired. And the thing is, too, like, they're really, they were really biting themselves in the back because wasn't it, like, Starbucks that made it so that in order to transfer to another store to work there, like, because the union that was no longer, like, it was in talks that it was, like, more complicated now. It, it became more complicated to cover shifts at another store once we were unionized. mm or did I just make that up? I think you might. I think that's something that they try to tell us. It's not true. So, you can so, so <laughs> I see. But it's true. Like Starbucks, like was telling everyone that like if you unionize, like you wouldn't be able to transfer stores. Like somebody at my store was told by a support manager that they wouldn't be able to transfer stores if we unionized, knowing that that was an important issue to that person. Yeah. So like if so, it, they they could have easily just had those people go on spring break and be like, hey, we will pull all the workers from these other stores and have them cover shifts. Because I was working here during spring break and I wanted to work forty hours a week because I was trying to make some money. Yeah. I mean, I was working like twenty. Wow. They could have easily right. just got other people that wanted to make money during spring break to cover these shifts and they didn't. And. That manager ended up closing the store for two days to remodel and just, like, move things around. The store on College Ave. Yeah. That was also the week um, leading up to our union vote. I see. Okay. So. And from what you heard, because I understand there was somebody at that store who had worked there for 12 years. Is that right? A barista? 14. Not at that store, but with the company. With I the forget company. forget how long she at the store for. I see. And Less from what she said yeah. or other people said, would you get the impression that what they did during spring break was something they wouldn't do under in normal times? Absolutely. Yeah. Like people who have worked at that store for several years were like, there's never been a problem getting mm -hmm. that time off, especially because during breaks, like College Town is a ghost town, basically. Mm -hmm. And like one of our previous managers told our union buster that that was the case. Mm -hmm. And... So it was just like very blatant that she was trying to put people in this position to choose their family or their job uh, just to push people out. And like she did that for summer break too. 
a bunch of people got pushed out for summer break. No, it feels so inhumane. So, like, they really do not care about their workers. They, they really don't. They do not care. They're operating on a money first level, completely contradicting. They're operating on a union busting first level, profit second, honestly, at this point. Yes, point. yes. And it's, it's just, it feels so cold. It feels so cold. Just the measures mm-hmm. that they go. Yeah. They're really just trying to pull people from the outside. Like, they're trying to rebrand completely. Yeah. It's like they don't even trust their own workers. It's, it's so true. It's so weird. They really don't. <laughs> yeah, because they think their workers are, like, we're some, like, outside force coming in. When they're the- bringing in the outside forces. Yeah. We just want what's best for the company. That's a thing. Like, I don't think they realize that, like, all we want is just a better environment so we can have a better time at this job and make a better experience for, like, customers and everybody mm-hmm. involved. We're not trying to, like, ruin the corporation. We're just trying yeah. to make it better. Yeah. We're trying to work with them. And they're like, no. All of this sounds to me uh, retaliatory, um, which, of course, is illegal. So I was wondering if you could fill me in a little bit. I know that the union has filed a number of unfair labor practice, ULP, complaints with Mm -hmm. the National Labor Relations Board. And I wonder if you could um, speak about those at all or what the status of them is or what you expect, whether you Mm. expect any, any protection to come to you from the state. What are the ULPs that have been filed? There's like... A little over a hundred filed for about Ithaca specifically. Yeah, wow, for Ithaca. As what if I'm remember? Correctly. Can you give me an idea of what some of them are? I mean, like all of the constructive discharges, like at my store, where what people, are constructive discharges? It's like when someone quits but was like pushed into quitting like by me. the condition. Yeah, like <laughs> stuff exactly. Right. And like my coworkers who like were forced to pick between seeing their family or having a job. Those are all constructive discharges. We have ULPs for all of them. We're also filing an unfair labor practice over them closing College Ave. Yes. So, yeah, we're. I think we're just still waiting for that to go through court. Um, the, it's a very slow process. Yeah. Have any yeah. of them Have any of them come to court yet? Um, I don't think so. We're like a part of. We're a part of something bigger, and it doesn't just stop at Starbucks. And yeah. like everything that we do helps workers organizing elsewhere and all of the workers organizing elsewhere is helping us we've like taken a lot like we've gone through a lot they've closed our store they're coming after the two other stores in Ithaca really hard right now making people suffer a lot things are really hard right now and who like who knows what's gonna happen like Starbucks has a lot of power like I'm Mm -hmm. gonna keep fighting but like I'm going to, we're like, we are going to be in this fight for a long time and it's like just starting again. So by way of wrap up, what would you like, what idea would you like to close this interview with? Steph, can we start with you? As a member of the union, it can feel very exhausting, but I think it's important to remember that we have people to fall back on to re-energize us because I think that's what Starbucks wants. They want us to feel defeated. They want us to feel exhausted, but this fight is far from over. While they might have gotten me Um, to wave my white flag. We got many people across the nation fighting strong and hard. And as long as this union keeps growing, I feel like we can win. It'll take some time, and Starbucks is not going to let up in in showing how much they hate unions. But I have faith in our union that we will pull through. What about you, Nadia? I resonate with a lot of what you said, Steph. Um, I don't, I mean, none of us going into this ever thought it was going to be easy. I honestly, like, didn't think it was going to be this hard, but... It was, it's shocking. It's it's a little shocking, honestly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's been, like, a lot, and a lot of people are getting really hurt right now by Starbucks. Like, Starbucks is actively harming their partners, finding their weak spots and exploiting that. Yeah, it's really hard, but also, like, it's necessary. Like, it's time that we do this. And as workers in general, like, at Starbucks and elsewhere, like, we can't keep keep being treated this way. And, like, that won't stop unless we all, like, stand up together and do something about it. Um, It's inhumane. They're showing their true colors right now. Exactly. Like, we're making history right now, Mm -hmm. and workers organizing outside of Starbucks are making history right now. That was Nadia Vitek and Steph Hawkins telling Jane Glaubman about life at a union-busting company. Workers on strike, those who have been fired by Starbucks, those who have been forced to quit by 
um, unacceptable conditions. They all need money. Unfortunately, um, Starbucks responding to their legal right to organize by depriving these people of their livelihood is morally wrong and it's illegal. Moreover, their struggle is a part of the fight for better working conditions for all of us. You can contribute to their strike fund and help them get by using the link in the description of this video. This has been Ithaca DSA Presents. I'm Teresa Alt, here with David Foote. One, two, one, two, three.